Well, welcome everybody. My name is Peter Julian. I'm a member of parliament for Burnaby New Westminster and welcome to the ninth annual Disability Tax Credit Seminars. We had one yesterday at the Edmonds Community Centre. It was packed. Over 100 people came out. Uh, so there were a lot fewer donuts and Timbits to go around. That tonight you're lucky. We have a smaller group, which is great, more intimate, and there's uh, more donuts for everybody. I am uh, very pleased to welcome here tonight uh, live streaming uh, across Burnaby and New Westminster, and indeed across British Columbia and right across Canada, and you could even say around the world, live streaming this event is uh, newwest.tv. And I'd just like to introduce uh, the team that is here from newwest.tv. They do fantastic work in the community and they live stream uh, uh, public events so that they, they go right across our community. And indeed, uh, because there's interest beyond our community, it goes to other parts of the province and other parts of uh, Canada. So Deepak Shrezabudi, uh, Stacey Ashton, Susan Miller, Rod Prada, Joanna Bartels, if you could welcome them, that terrific work. We appreciate them being here tonight. We also have uh, Spring Herald, who is our American Sign Language interpreter, who is here tonight. And two people that have done enormous uh, work to prepare both last night and tonight uh, in my office, Sandra Bell, my constituency assistant, and Teresa Ho, did a terrific job in setting this up tonight. Now, this is an important uh, annual tax credit seminar. We have been trying to get the word out in the community now for nine years. And uh, you may have heard back in 2012, the federal government uh, prohibited Revenue Canada employees from actually providing information about this important, these important programs. So what we're endeavoring to do tonight is to make sure you have the information and your families have the information, but also even more importantly, that you get the information out to other people in the community. It's very important that uh, families that have a person with a disability in the family are aware of the tax credits and the benefits and programs that are available to them. And since the federal government doesn't like to talk about it, uh, we think it's very important to let you know about it so you can let other people know about it in the community. So we're going to start tonight um, with uh, a special guest who uh, is kind of the poster boy for the disability tax credit. Tonight there will be four parts. After the first three parts, we'll be stopping for questions, and we're going to be handing out a, a microphone so we can get it live streamed on newwest.tv. Uh, the whole presentation will take less than an hour. And then for those folks who've got all the information they need, you can leave. Uh, other people who may have specific questions uh, regarding their family uh, or regarding casework, uh, I'm, I'm pleased to stay for another hour afterwards and sit down with you individually, okay? Does that sound good to everybody? Well, we're going to start then with my friend George Doring, who is right there standing beside me. And I've done this presentation now right across Canada in over 100 communities. And George is the poster boy. Tonight, he's actually here to tell his story. Please welcome George Doring. And I'll give you the mic here, George. Okay. There you go. For testing, testing. Yep. It's for okay. the TV, yeah. Anyway, the first time I uh, attended Peter's seminar was in uh, 2009. And since I'm disabled, I thought this is a good chance to learn more about it. So I went to his seminar and I was very pleased to, to learn what he had to say. And I wrote a letter after that. And I read it to you, even so you can read it here, which is hard to say. Hard to say, okay, I'm not used to it. <laughs> Uh, I attended a meeting chaired by Peter Julian, MP for Burnaby, New Westminster. That was before we changed this thing again. It was a well-prepared information meeting regarding disability tax credit. Since I had a disability since 1960, I did not know there would be some relief from the federal government until our MP held those meetings. I was able, after my doctor witnessed the form T2201, that I was markedly, and I impressed it again, markedly disabled, to get a tax credit for the preceding 10 years. Only 10 years they pay back, but they do pay back if you're markedly disabled. 
my tax credit amounted to, now get this, $13,012.52. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Julian, I call him Peter now. Thank you, Mr. Julian, for caring. Sincerely, George. Now, I got the check here, or two checks. They send me one pretty quick and another one for adjustment because they adjust for 10 years. And you have to be markedly disabled for vision or feeding, speaking, dressing, hearing, walking, mental functions, or elimination, which I'm suffering from. I got gastrointestinal difficulties and digestive problems. I don't want to go into detail. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. So G George has been featured then in over 100 communities across the country, from St. John's, Newfoundland, right through here to, to Burnaby, New Westminster. So he is the poster boy for and the disability French. tax credit. Pardon me? And in French. And, and in French and in English, yeah, in the both official languages. So we'll start off now with the first part, which is on the disability tax credit. And I've got Teresa helping me out. As George mentioned, you're eligible for the disability tax credit if on form T2201, and we'll come back to that in just a moment, a qualified practitioner certifies any of the following. So you only have to qualify for one of these four categories. First, that you're blind. Second, that you have a severe and prolonged impairment in a physical or mental function that markedly restricts your ability to perform a basic activity of daily living. George mentioned this, and we'll come back to the issue of being markedly uh, markedly restricted in just a moment. Uh, thirdly, and remember you can only need one of these, as a result of significant restrictions in two or more basic activities of daily living, including vision, the cumulative effect is equivalent to being markedly restricted. So you can be restricted in one activity or you can have some fairly significant restrictions in two activities and that cumulative effect can be the same as uh, having a disability in one activity. And the fourth, and as I, as I mentioned, any one of these qualifies you for the disability tax credit. You need and dedicate time specifically for life-sustaining therapy to support a vital function. So even if you don't have a disability, if you have to have life-sustaining therapy, you can qualify for the disability tax credit. Now, what are the basic activities of daily living? George just mentioned them, but they bear repeating. It's uh, things that would just be common sense. These are activities that are essential for daily life. It's speaking, feeding, hearing, dressing, walking, mental functions necessary for everyday life, and we'll come back to that in a moment, and elimination, bowel or bladder functions, as George mentioned, uh, for him, that is what qualified him for the disability tax credit, elimination, bowel or bladder functions. Those are the basic activities that if they are restricted, can qualify you for the disability tax credit. Now, markedly restricted is the definition that Revenue Canada uses. And what they mean by that is all or substantially all of the time, that means uh, 90 to 100% of the time, uh, an individual is unable to perform one or more of the basic activities of daily living, even with therapy and the use of appropriate devices and medication. Now, what that means to be markedly restricted is that it takes you at least three times longer than it would take you if you didn't have the disability. So if 90 to 100% of the time, it takes you at least three times longer to do something, one of those basic activities of daily living, uh, than it would take you if you did not have that disability, uh, that would mean that you could qualify for the disability tax credit. And as I mentioned earlier, you can have a cumulative effect it's significantly restricted. If you don't meet the criteria for markedly restricted, 90 to 100% of the time it takes you three times longer than a person without the disability. If you have a number of basic activities that are significantly restricted, 75 to 90% of the time it takes you three times longer than a person without that disability, then the cumulative impact of those disabilities could qualify you for the disability tax credit. 
And we have life-sustaining therapy. This is therapy that supports a vital function. Kidney dialysis is one example. Uh, lung therapy would be another. But to qualify, the individual has to dedicate time for the therapy at least three times a week for an average of at least 14 hours a week. We're talking about uh, fairly significant life-sustaining therapy, three times a week for an average of at least 14 hours per week. And we're talking about prolonged disabilities, and that's an impairment that has lasted or is expected to last at least 12 months. So sometimes I'll get a question like this. I had a car accident. For six months, I couldn't walk. And then following that, I went through a rehabilitation program. It took me three months. And after that rehabilitation program, now things are going well. I can walk, no problems at all. But for nine months, I was disabled. Do I qualify for the disability tax credit? And the answer, of course, is no, because you need to have been disabled for at least a period of 12 months or that your doctor expects the disability to last at least 12 months to qualify for the disability tax credit. Now, who can fill out the disability tax credit form? A medical doctor can do it for all kinds of disabilities, an optometrist for vision, an audiologist for hearing. My, my wife is a clinical audiologist, so she often will fill out these forms. Occupational therapist for walking, feeding, and dressing. Psychologist for mental functions. It can also be psychiatrists, of course. Speech language pathologist for speaking. Physiotherapist for walking. That is not the only list, but this gives you an indication of the specialists that can fill out the disability tax credit form. But of course, uh, your family doctor if he or she is familiar with your disability, can fill out uh, the form for all of these disabilities. So you have the form. Well, well, we'll just finish the presentation, then we'll go to questions. So the form T2201, the Disability Tax Credit Certificate, is really the uh, door that opens up for the Disability Tax Credit. Does everybody have a copy of the Disability Tax Credit Certificate? It's, um, it, it says right on the top, uh, Sandra has some additional copies. Does anyone not have one? The Disability Tax Credit Certificate? Does anybody not have this? Uh, everybody has it? Yeah. Okay, terrific. Well, thanks Sandra. We'll start off uh, by turning to page two. <coughs> on page two, you'll see the self-assessment questionnaire. And that's really the starting point. After tonight, uh, we'll finish up the presentation. You'll take a few timbits, put them in your pocket, go home. Then you can sit down at your kitchen table and go through the self-assessment questionnaire. That'll give you a sense of whether or not you might qualify for the disability tax credit. Go through the self-assessment and that'll give you an initial sense before you decide to go visit your doctor. So that's the first step to take tonight. Take a timbit and read the self-assessment questionnaire. Second thing I'd like to show you is on the back, on the final page. If we go right to the back, you'll see in the bottom, you'll see a box that says uh, certification. Everybody see that? There's a number of uh, boxes. It says tick the box that applies to you. This is for your medical doctor. And uh, you have a bit of a challenge ahead of you if your doctor is anything like my doctor. Uh, because you're going to have to get your doctor to sign this, but also to write legibly their address, their name, the date, the num telephone number. I don't know about your doctor, but my doctor just writes chicken scratch. It's impossible to decipher what he's writing. So you got to make sure your doctor writes legibly and make sure that it's fully filled out because the reality is Revenue Canada is going to try to verify if it's a valid doctor. So you've got to have a telephone number that is readable, an address and a name as well. So make sure it's all written legibly. And then the third point is, if we go to page six, mental functions necessary for everyday life. If we go to page six, mental functions necessary for everyday life. Uh, often people will ask me, somebody who has uh, Alzheimer's disease, can that person qualify for the disability tax credit? And if you look at page six, mental functions necessary for everyday life, You'll see the second point, memory, for example, the ability to remember simple instructions, basic personal information such as name and address, or material of importance and interest. 
So of course, what that means is somebody who has Alzheimer's disease can qualify for the disability tax credit. So you've got your T2201, the disability tax credit certificate. You've done the self-assessment questionnaire. You've got the qualified practitioner, your medical doctor, who has signed the document and written legibly on it so that they can contact your doctor. Uh, it's important to note you can submit the form T2201 to your tax center at any time during the year. Don't wait for next year's income tax. Once it's completed, you can come by my office, which is on 76156th Street, just up here at 15th Avenue. Uh, so not far from New Westminster Secondary School. You can go up, but we'll send it in for you. But make sure you do it as soon as possible, particularly if you have a disability that dates back uh, at least 10 years, like George did. If you wait a year, you're going to lose a year of eligibility, which means you could be losing $1,300. It's more important that that money be in your pocket than in the federal government's. So make sure you don't delay and uh, submit the form as soon as your doctor has filled it out. Now, if the disability tax credit is not approved, you can check the explanation against your application. Sometimes it's just that the doctor forgot to sign or that the doctor wrote chicken scratch so Revenue Canada wasn't able to verify whether or not it was a valid doctor. So that's the first step. You can also send in additional information to the disability tax credit unit of your tax center for another review and you have the right to file a formal objection to appeal the decision. We can also help you. Uh, my office up on 6th Street, Sandra and, and Teresa are real go-getters, and we'll make sure that we do everything we can if your application is rejected to turn that rejection into an acceptance. But the point here is just because Revenue Canada says no the first time doesn't mean that we can't turn the no into a yes. Don't accept the no until we've done everything we can to make sure that uh, we've pushed back on Revenue Canada. Now, for prior years, prior tax returns can be adjusted to include a claim for the disability amount. George mentioned that earlier. In his case, he went back 10 years, which is the limit. You can go back 10 years or back to the date when you became disabled. You need to reassess those years by sending the Canada Revenue Agency a completed form T1ADJ, which is called the T1 adjustment request. We have copies of that in my office if you need it and what you do is basically fill out a form for every year that you want reassessed. So if you're going back 10 years uh, it doesn't take long but you're going to have to send out uh, those 10 requests to reassess each of those previous years. The good news is for future years you don't need a new form T2201 if your medical doctor has said the disability is permanent Revenue Canada is pretty good on that. They'll just uh, assume that from now on you're disabled and you don't need to refile that form every year. Now, the disability amount is a non-reimbursable credit. That means that what it does is it serves to reduce your income tax uh, pay payable or it provides your reimbursement on income tax that you've paid in the past. Now, uh, for some people with disabilities, they don't necessarily pay income tax. Uh, so that won't help you as much. However, the good news is, as it is retroactive, it's also transferable. So if you can't use the full disability amount to reduce your taxes to zero, you can transfer the amount to your spouse or common law partner. And if they're paying taxes, they can then take that amount, get the reimbursement on your taxes paid in the past, or reduce your income tax to be paid uh, as a family. You can also transfer it to another supporting person who can claim any unused amount as a disability amount transferred from a dependent. Uh, the one catch is we're talking about family members that live under the same roof. So it's very difficult to transfer it to somebody that you're not living with, but if you have a disability, you can transfer it to your son or your daughter, you can transfer it to a father or a mother, if you're living in the, in the same family, you can transfer it to another supporting person. So we've just talked about the disability tax credit. Uh, it is a, the entry point is the T2201. You've got to go see your doctor to get that filled out. And then from there, you can get uh, your previous tax years reassessed. You can also transfer the amounts to a spouse or to another uh, person who supports you within the family. And the important 
starting point really is the self-assessment questionnaire that you can do after we complete the presentation tonight. So that finishes part one of the four-part presentation tonight. Are there any questions on that? And I think, George, you had something you wanted to add. Uh, I'll just ask Sandra to uh, take the mic there. Thank you. Uh, anyway, I wanted to mention <coughs> uh, my, when my doctor signed it, he chicken scratched it too. Yes, okay. And I, <laughs> uh, I sent the business card of his along, so that really cleared it up. Good, and, good point. Yeah. And you had to have worked and made money in order to get the money back from the government. That's all I have to say. Okay, thanks, George. So are there any questions? I think we had a question down. Uh, you had a question here? Yeah, okay, well, we'll just hold on for the mic. This is for uh, people back east who are watching us tonight. There was something in the newspaper that I'd seen um, probably about six months ago, and actually they were talking about getting disability um, tax credit back, but they were saying that you had to go through having um, someone in your family, like a brother, or to, to sort of sign off on saying that you've had this disability for 10 years. And there was a company name that was people were going through, and they were getting some of the profit from the disability check, whereas you could have just done it on your own. I'm wondering if this is the same thing. Yes, it is. And, and this is something, I, I'm going to start a rant, so you'll have to stop me after about 30 seconds. But because the federal government isn't publicizing the disability tax credit, uh, there are some companies that have moved in to fill the void, and they are taking up to 50% of the, what the disability tax credit uh, reimbursement is to families. So you can imagine in George's case, if uh, he'd gone through a company, instead of getting $13,000, he'd be paying $6,500 to a company that isn't doing much more than what we're doing tonight. That that's the reality, and I, I, that's one thing that I criticize the federal government strongly on. They should be providing this information to families so that people aren't getting ripped off. And to pay one-third or one-half of your disability tax credit reimbursement for work that takes only a few hours, I think, is, uh, is a ripoff. And so we're trying to get the word out by holding these uh, forums right across the country. Um, Can you, had I? A, you had a comment on that? We've got a few more questions. So, so I guess the reason that they were asking for a brother or somebody to fill it out was because they were going, they were not doing it properly, going through the like. I, I'm not sure, but the ads that okay. I've seen are basically they're taking any way from, anywhere from a third to a half. Okay, thank of the you. Reimbursement. We've got a question here uh, and two three more. We'll take uh, four or five questions and then we'll move on to part two. Yeah. Thank you. You're a lovely man. So thanks for having us all That's here. Nice. That's lovely of you to say. No, I'm in a rant. <laughs> <laughs> How many times can you actually apply for this? And one thing I'd really encourage you to do, Mr. Wonderful MP, is private members bill that this paperwork, the disparity is insane. Because with that mental function part, my son has autism. We've been turned down. The child sitting next to him has autism. They get it. So you look at that, and it all comes down to how the doctor fills the form up. We have a lovely doctor, but he's way too positive when he does forms. So I think that's something that also needs to be addressed. So we've reapplied, but how many times can you apply for this? Is there a limit if we're turned down again? No, no, there's no limit in the number of times you can apply, uh, but maybe we should sit down afterwards and talk about your, your specific case. I do have a, a number of private members' bills, uh, including around uh, folks who are deaf, deaf, and hard of hearing, because the, uh, the level uh, required for deaf, deaf, and hard of hearing people is far too high. And so it's, uh, the bill that I have has been endorsed by the Canadian Hard of Hearing Association and the Canadian uh, Academy of Audiologists. So there are a lot of uh, improvements that we can make to this program. Uh, there's a federal election next year, and I'm hoping uh, we'll get the opportunity to make those improvements. But in the meantime, even with all of the problems that exist in the program, it's still a lot better that folks know about this than that people not know about all the, the advantages that exist. Okay, I think we've got, uh, and thanks very much for your comment. We've got one, two, uh, three, and four, and, that, and that'll be it. Then we'll move on to part two. Yes. 
Okay, my my questions. Uh, my question is quite s straightforward and simple. I just wondered why the government's not advertising and letting people know. That, that's, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, I think in part it's because they uh, like talking about having the program, particularly an international forum, but they don't necessarily want to make the payouts that are involved with the program. And uh, we're going to come to part two in a moment, and uh, I'll give you a specific example of why the government likes to talk about the program but doesn't like to publicize the program, which to me is a real contradiction. Thanks. Hi, uh, I just wanted to ask if you were aware of a uh, organization called the National Benefit Authority. And um, unlike the other ones you had mentioned, they had helped me out. I'm a person with disabilities. And I got like $13,000 or something and they only took like like 1,000, so they took like 5% or not even that. And I was just wanting to know if you were aware of that organization. Um, I am aware of organizations uh, like that that are taking less money back. Um, so I'm glad that they didn't take the 50% or 33% that some companies are. Yeah. But I still think it's the responsibility of the federal government to publicize this. Oh, I agree 100%. Yeah. yeah. But thank you. Uh, I think we've got one uh, one here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, I, I have a question. It's about the under one, under one roof. Um, <clears throat> uh, my daughter is in uh, residence under medical accommodation in Ottawa. Uh, so does under one or like her her primary re residence would be here in New West, in in terms of you know what everybody thinks when you go off to college. So does that count? <clears throat> uh, but wait, is she, does she come back in, uh, at the, uh, for summers? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So her permanent residence is here? Yeah, it would be your permanent, it would be your permanent residence. Okay. Yeah, but if, if she lives year-round in Ottawa, then you, you, you couldn't say that you live under the same roof. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we'll just, yeah. yeah, the gentleman that was here, yeah. Hi, thank you. If I understood correctly, um, if I have had, if I have not had an income for 10 years, because I, well, I had private disability for seven years, then I turned 65, and then life fell apart, hmm. um, does that mean I would be ineligible because I haven't paid taxes in 10 years? My, at the end of the year, my income is zero. They keep telling me I don't have to send them forms. They thank me very much. Yeah, yeah. Um, but they say, you know, you're, you're not earning anything. We know what the disability was, so stop it. But I send it anyhow. I yeah. like a paper trail. Yes, yeah. And so the disability tax credit is one thing, but we're going to go on in the second and fourth parts to talk about other programs that uh, don't necessarily depend on people having a taxable income. So uh, there's a number of other programs uh, that may be, uh, may be more interesting to you. Thank you. Uh, okay, we'll just take this lady and the gentleman at the back, and that's it, okay? And then we'll move on to the second part. If you have other questions, we'll, we'll answer them afterwards. Yes, ma'am. Yes, my question is this. There's no increase in the disability. Since I started in 95, but the amount is the same until now. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the question was around a disability benefit, which is different from what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, there hasn't been an increase, and you're absolutely right. Um, but that's actually not what we're really addressing tonight. But maybe we can sit down afterwards and, and talk more about uh, the disability benefits you're getting. Okay. Yeah. And uh, the gentleman right over there at the back, we'll just, get the, we'll just get the microphone over to you so that the folks who are watching us... Uh, no, it's, for the TV. it's for the TV. TV, TV changes everything. I'm on TV? Wow. You're on TV. Um, I was told that because I don't contribute to income tax that I cannot deduct anything from income tax. Like yes. I'm handicapped and I, you know, a battery for my scooter costs 500 bucks yet I can't use it. Yeah. 
Yes, yeah, and that's, that's uh, similar to the other question that the other gentleman was asking. Um, so we'll go on to some of the other programs a little bit later on, and perhaps we can sit down afterwards and talk about your specific case. Okay, thank you very much. So we're going to move on to part two now. And part two is uh, where I tell you that a member of your family could potentially get up to $90,000 from the federal government. That's up to $90,000 from the federal government. Do you believe me? Sure. Really? Yeah. No, normally people say, no, you're crazy. <laughs> Seriously. Well, that's, that's great. Well, thank you very much. I don't need to explain the second part then. <laughs> uh, but I will just to say, it's the Registered Disability Savings Plan. And the entry point is the T2201. So the Disability Tax Credit Certificate that we've just looked at. That's what you need to look at opening a registered disability savings plan. And I'll say right off at the beginning uh, that your first step, if you've got a member of your family who has a disability, is to shop around. There, there are some credit unions in town that have a good knowledge of this program. Uh, there are some banks that have a good uh, knowledge of the program. There are some financial advisors that have a good knowledge of the pro program as well. In fact, one of them is here tonight. And, and what you need to do is ask around because uh, it's not all the banks, not all the financial advisors, and not all the credit unions that really understand the program and you need a good one uh, because you want to make sure you maximize the benefit from this program. Uh, you may have heard uh, former finance minister Jim Flaherty uh, passed away last week. I, I gave a eulogy in the House of Commons on Friday morning. Uh, he was uh, the driving force around creating this back in 2008 and I gave him full credit for it. This is a program uh, that can really help people with disabilities. A problem is the federal government, uh, after he pushed it through, decided not to do a lot of uh, publicity around it. So a lot of families don't even know that it exists. That's the difference, I think, between uh, the federal government, who likes to champion the fact that they are responding to the needs of people with disabilities, particularly at the United Nations, when we talk about the International Year of People with Disabilities, but at home is not providing the information to families that could benefit from this program. So Jim Flaherty did a good job of pushing this through cabinet, uh, but the, the government has tried to kind of cover it up a little bit. And that's why it's important to get this information out. So the Registered Disability Savings Plan is a savings plan that's established to help save for the long-term financial security of a person who is eligible for the disability amount. Now contributions are not tax deductible and are not included as income when they're withdrawn. So if the family makes a contribution to the RDSP, uh, they're not included as income when they're withdrawn. Contributions can be made by the family until the end of the year in which the beneficiary turns 59. There's no annual contribution limit. However, the overall lifetime limit for a beneficiary is 200,000. That's the limit of what the family can put into the account. And income earned in the plan will be included as income when it's paid out of the RDSP. So that's interesting. Uh, family can contribute up to 200,000, but what's in it for the family? What is the particular benefit that comes with this? Well, it's because there are two federal programs designed to supplement funds in the RDSP, the Canada Disability Savings Grants and Canada Disability Savings Bonds. Now, these are two programs that come from the federal government that help to supplement the amount that the family puts into the, the RDSP. First, the Canada Disability Savings Grants. So let's say the family puts in $1,000. The federal government is going to pay a matching grant of 100% or 200% or up to 300% depending on family income. So if the family puts in $1,000, the federal government will put in 1000 or perhaps 2000 or up to $3,000, depending on family income. That's when it starts to get interesting. Now, an RDSP can receive matching grants, a maximum of $3,500 in any one year, and up to $70,000 over the beneficiary's lifetime. So $3,500 over 20 years, that makes the maximum of $70,000. Uh, in the RDSP from the savings grant. Now, here's the catch and something that's important to note. The grant can be paid into the RDSP on contributions made up until the December 30, 31st of the year when the beneficiary turns 49. 
Now, so that means that we're talking about a program that is particularly helpful to people uh, who are uh, as young adults. Though, I was in uh, Sherbrooke, Quebec a few weeks back, and a deaf woman said, I'm 48, is this program going to help me? Well, the reality is, you can go back to 2008 uh, retroactively, which is when the program uh, was begun. And in her case, even at 48, she can go back to 2008, and in her case, she would have uh, get, gotten about $12,000 in matching grants. So, it is a benefit even to somebody who is at 48, but for uh, an adult in the mid-20s, they can really maximize all of the benefits that come from the program. But that's not all. There's also the Canada Disability Savings Bonds. Now, that's, the government will pay income-tested bonds of up to $1,000 a year to low-income Canadians with disabilities, regardless of the amount contributed. So even if you do not have a penny to put in the account, the government, with, uh, after testing the income, could be providing up to $1,000 a year. Now, it's $1,000 a year times 20 years, which makes a lifetime bond limit of $20,000. It's the same limitation. The bond can be paid into the RDSP until the year in which the beneficiary turns 49 years of age. So even in a case where somebody has no income, they can still benefit through the Canada Disability Savings Bonds. Now, who can open an RDSP? The beneficiary, the person with a disability, can do it themselves. Or if the beneficiary is a minor, a, a child or a teenager, Another person can open this for the beneficiary if that person is the legal parent of the beneficiary, a guardian, tutor, or curator of the beneficiary, or even a public department, agency, or institution. So, the government gives and the government takes away. Exactly. So, here's the catch. The RDSP is a long-term savings plan. When money is withdrawn from the RDSP, all the grants and all the bonds paid into the RDSP during the 10 years before the withdrawal must be paid to the government, must be repaid. That's a very severe penalty. So we're really talking about, ideally, a 30-year time horizon, 20 years to maximize the grants and the bonds, and another 10 years to lock in that money so that the federal government can't penalize you by taking back grants and bonds paid during the last 10 years. Now, it's the same situation if the beneficiary passes away. Uh, it, it will not go to their estate. There will be the penalty of all grants and bonds uh, that have been in the RDSP for less than 10 years. But of course, all the other money, including the private contributions, investment income earned, and grants and bonds that have been in the RDSP for more than 10 years, uh, they would be paid to the beneficiary or the beneficiary's estate. So, we've talked about the re Registered Disability Savings Plan, that you can get up to $70,000 from matching grants, up to $20,000 are bonds, which makes a total of $90,000 potentially that you can get from the federal government. Now, there were a couple of people that said no when I asked earlier. So now do you believe me that you can get up to $90,000 from the federal government? Yeah? Yeah? Okay, good. So you, with the RDSP, you can benefit from that. And particularly when you think of uh, somebody in your family who has a disability, a young adult or a teenager or a child, this can really make a difference over the long term to secure their long term financial security. So are there any questions now? This is the end of part two. So we're more than halfway through. Are there any questions on the registered disability savings plan? And I'll ask Sandra to uh, bring the mic so that folks watching from Toronto and Winnipeg and other points beyond can uh, can hear your questions. Uh, oh, what yeah. happens to people who are on fixed incomes and um, after 10 years, they get the 10000 or $20,000. Does that um, interrupt their benefits that they're getting already? Uh, no. Uh, you mean when they start to withdraw money? Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, at this point, no, because the, the money that you're putting aside uh, is a contribution from the federal government. Uh, there is, if you have a certain level, because there is income tax that would be deducted if, if your income is high enough, that would be the one, uh, the one thing to watch for. 
but the, the major concern is making sure that you're locking in that money so that you're not penalized for the grants and bonds. You actually get to keep that as well as the investment income. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a question at the back there. I have some, I have some confusion. Uh, the one I noticed when you started this presentation, it said 59. And then now it's 49. That's what I had understanding, which I was informed last year. And now, what, can you explain this one with the 59? F 59 is the limit for family contributions. So a family can contribute to the RDSP up until the year when the beneficiary turns 59. But for the grants and the bonds, uh, they are limited to 49, which is a discrepancy. And this is one of the things we have to look at uh, I think in terms of improving the program uh, because as we know in terms of uh, people with disabilities they're actually living longer. Uh, the 49 is, is something that some disability groups has criticized as being uh, too, low, uh, too low in age. So that's the di differential. 49 for the grants and bonds, 59 for family contributions. Okay, well thank you very much. So we're now going to move on to part three, which gets us very close to part four, which is the most difficult part of the evening. But we'll start with part three. Part three is on medical expenses. Now, medical expenses you know about. These are uh, non-reimbursable uh, <coughs> non credits. So what they do is they reduce your income tax to be paid, or they give you, uh, of course, a reimbursement on income tax you've paid in the past. But there are some aspects of medical expenses that you may not be aware of. Things, expenses that you may have had that you can actually go retroactively and claim the credit uh, as part of your medical expenses. So we know medical expenses can include things like payments made to a medical doctor, a dentist, a nurse, or other medical professionals, or to a public or private hospital, prescription medications, and things like payments for artificial limbs, wheelchairs, crutches, hearing aids, prescription eyeglasses, contact lenses, dentures, pacemakers, uh, and prescription medical devices. For a full list on the Canada Revenue site, you can go to their, uh, their website and they've got a full list. Or if you want a full list from us, we can uh, print it off and send it to you as well. It's about a 14-page list of medical expenses. So those are the things we're aware of. But here's things that people are less aware. For example, for a specially equipped van to transport a disabled individual, you can claim 20% of the cost, up to a maximum of $5,000. Now, only a person who requires the use of a wheelchair and who, la who has a disability and a severe and prolonged mobility impairment can claim this expense. Also, additional costs of building or renovating a principal residence to allow for more accessibility for a person with a disability, that can be claimed. Now, this is important. We're talking about renovations that aren't to increase the value of the house, but renovations that are to increase the accessibility. I'm sure you've all seen the television commercials with the elevator that goes up the stairway. Right? That's a fairly expensive item, but it increases the accessibility of the house. So those types of costs that allow you to provide more accessibility for a person with disability can be claimed as a medical expense, and that's uh, very important. Also, if you have to move because you need a, a, an apartment or a townhome that is more accessible, you can claim moving expenses up to a maximum of $2,000. And normally, every time I give this presentation, somebody will say, well, we moved last year. We didn't know you could claim moving expenses. So you can claim moving expenses as medical expenses, and that's an important, uh, important thing to remember. What is not included in medical expenses is athletic club fees, blood pressure monitors, health plan premiums paid by an employer and not included in your income, uh, health programs, organic foods. Anyone here eat organic foods? Anybody? Nobody eats? Okay, yeah, we got two or three. Yeah, unfortunately, they're not included as a medical expense. But if you have an allergy to gluten, and that's happening more and more, the difference in price between uh, normal food and food that is gluten-free, that can be included as a medical expense. 
Uh, so we're seeing more and more people that have to go on gluten-free diets. If that's what your doctor has uh, diagnosed, uh, the difference in cost can go as a medical expense. Uh, now, what is not included in medical expenses also includes over-the-counter medication, vitamins and supplements, personal response systems such as Lifeline. Nobody here needs that because you're all beautiful people, but if somebody needed cosmetic surgery, then that would not be included as a medical expense. And for attendant care, amounts that you or your spouse or common-law partner have paid for attendant care including in your home, in retirement homes or nursing homes, special schools or group homes, they can be included as a medical expense. This is paid for yourself or for your spouse and paid for an attendant that is 18 years of age or older. Now for attendant care, what we're in including is your share of the salaries and wages paid for care in an establishment to all employees who perform the following duties food preparation, housekeeping services, laundry services, health care, activities, salon services, transportation, and security. It doesn't include uh, basics like rent, food, cleaning supplies, maintenance of common areas and outside grounds, and salaries and wages paid to employees such as administrators, receptionists, groundkeepers, janitors, and maintenance staff. And of course, if you're receiving homemaker services in your home, you can only claim attendant care expenses for the period when you're at home and need care uh, or help. So if you go off on vacation for a few months, you come see me in Ottawa during the parliamentary session, you can't claim the homemaker services at the same time as you're away from your home. So that makes sense. Now, there's also medical expenses, transportation and travel. Normally when I give this presentation and uh, we're in a northern place uh, or a more remote community, uh, this has more value. But even in uh, the lower mainland, this is something you sometimes have to think about because uh, we're seeing more hospitals with specialized care. So sometimes folks have to go to Eagle Ridge, sometimes they have to go farther up the valley. If you have to travel at least 40 kilometers to obtain medical services, you may be able to claim the cost of public transportation or where public transportation is not available, vehicle expenses paid. If you had to travel at least 80 kilometers, for example, if you have to go over to uh, the island for uh, medical services, you may be able to claim transportation expenses, accommodation, meals, and parking. So that's important if you've had to travel to get those medical services. Now to claim transportation and travel expenses, the following criteria must be met substantially equivalent medical services are not available near your home, that you took a reasonably direct traveling route. So New Westminster, California, Victoria would not be considered a reasonably direct traveling route. And also it's reasonable under the circumstances for you to have traveled to that place for those medical services. Where we have waiting lists and you're referred to another hospital that's further on, uh, that's considered uh, a reasonable uh, reason for you to have to travel to get those medical services. So that can include waiting lists even in the lower mainland. Now if you did have to travel for medical services, there's two methods of calculation. The detailed method is keeping all your receipts, but I strongly suggest the simplified method. If you've had to travel, uh, we get in my office a flat rate per kilometer for British Columbia. And we can go back a few years if you need uh, information on what the flat rate was when you had to travel for those medical expenses. It makes a lot more sense and it actually is a, more of a benefit if you get the flat rate for transportation and travel to calculate your vehicle expenses. So we've just talked about medical expenses. We've talked about the fact that you can include renovations to make your home more accessible. You can include moving expenses if you had to move to a home an apartment that is more accessible and even uh, the, the charge up to up to five thousand dollars twenty percent for adapting your vehicle to, to make it more accessible and if you've had to travel of course uh, vehicle expenses is also something that you can calculate as part of medical expenses so this completes part three we're almost yeah it's exciting we're getting very close to part four are there any questions on medical expenses? And I'll just ask uh, Sandra to, to uh, okay. There we go. 
This is regarding the medical expenses. Now, I'm running into somewhat of a problem here, and it has to do with uh, the medical expense with regards to physiotherapy for re rehabilitation from an acquired head injury uh, with stroke. Uh, and I don't really have any of that. It, it, you have to pay it out. Uh, it might be minimal expenses, but they don't have that as medical expenses. So, sorry, they, you, you, you tried to claim them and... No, I've been trying to find a physiotherapist that's going to help me get better uh, okay, with regards yes. to my stroke symptoms yes. that I got from my, my uh, acquired head injury. Yes. And I noticed there's no help out there because I've dealt with the Fraser. Uh, Valley Health Unit. Okay, perhaps we can talk afterwards then about the uh, potential round physiotherapists. So we can maybe talk about that afterwards. Yeah, but that would be a kind of thing that would fit under medical expenses, of course, when you do find a, a good physiotherapist. And uh, we've got a question up here. I actually was, I, I worked for the park board for about 18 years. I got sick and um, they kept my job and I still have my job there, but I'm on disability. So I've been paying 100%. No, 50%. Uh, no. Well, no, they don't. They don't pay any. Um, sorry. Um, and basically what it is to keep uh, my plan, w w where I work, I have um, dental and medical, but because I'm off sick, um, I pay $80 a month to keep my plan going until I can come back to work. Can I um, claim that as a medical expense? Yeah, though it may not get you to uh, the deductible, right? Maybe we could talk about that Kay. afterwards as well. Thank you. Um, because that may not be sufficient for it to really bring you a benefit. Yeah. Okay. So I think I hear people ready for the final part, part four. Now... This is the tough part, so if you've got a Timbit hidden away in your pocket or your purse right now, this is the time to take it out and you're going to need that boost of energy or, or maybe uh, if you've got a little bit of caffeine, uh, suck back that coffee. Now, because the fourth part is, all, is like a 30,000 uh, overflight of all the other programs that are available for people with disabilities. So we're going to go over a lot of programs. now. Uh, as uh, Sandra and Teresa know, my longest speech in the House of Commons to date was a speech that lasted 14 hours. And to give all of the details about these programs, I figure it would take about 14 hours. So I was ready tonight to give you the 14-hour version. And Sandra and Teresa said, well, look, really, 14 hours might be a bit too long, even with the donuts and the coffee. Can you try to give folks a resume that's going to last instead about 14 minutes? So I just want to test the crowd to see which one you prefer. We do have a lot of donuts. We've got a lot of coffee. Um, I'm ready to go. I've had two cups of coffee, so I can last all night. Who would like the full 14-hour detailed presentation of part four? Wow, you're all wonderful people. Take extra donuts. Who, who would like the 14-minute resume and sleep in your own bed tonight? Oh, it's close, but I think the 14-minute one out. So we'll give you the 14-minute resume of all these other programs. Now, if you'd like a copy, rather than taking notes, because there's a lot of things that uh, are going to come up in the next few minutes, uh, we can send you a copy of this presentation. This presentation is a bootleg presentation that comes from Revenue Canada itself. Uh, it came from an employee who was very upset because the, the government cut out Revenue Canada's ability to actually give these presentations in the community. Uh, so one of the employees sent us this and said, please make sure everybody knows about these programs. So we can send you a copy of the presentation. Uh, just let us know and uh, we'll make sure that we get it out to you. And so that way you don't have to take notes. If you see something here that you like or you're interested in getting more information about, we can send you the presentation and we can follow up and give you additional information. Okay? So now in 14 minutes, here are all the other programs you need to think about. And we start about with the caregiver amount. And this is an amount that can be claimed on your income taxes if you maintained a dwelling where you and your dependent both live. Now the dependent may be you or your spouses or common law partners, child or grandchild. It could also be you or your spouse's brother, 
sister, niece, nephew, aunt, uncle, parent, or grandparent who is resident in Canada. In addition, the dependent must have been 18 years of age or older when he or she lived with you and dependent on you due to an impairment in physical or mental functions. It can also be if uh, he or she is uh, you or your spouse's parent or grandparent, if they're 65 years of age or older, you can qualify for the caregiver amount and you calculate that on your federal workshop, uh, worksheet. Secondly, disability supports deduction. Now, this is somebody who has a disability uh, who can claim attendant care expenses and other allowable expenses that allowed you to go to school or earn an income. Now, we've already talked about attending care expenses under medical expenses, right? But that's for medical expenses, attending care expenses in the home. The treatment, the financial treatment is much more beneficial and generous for the disability supports deduction. So if you include them all together and you claim all the attended care, uh, what Revenue Canada will simply do is lump them all in as medical expenses. You don't get as big a reimbursement. So make sure you separate out the attendant care expenses that were intended to help you go to school or earn income from employment because you'll get a, a more generous benefit or income tax credit with the disability supports deduction. Now, up until now, we've been talking about non-reimbursable credits. So I mentioned earlier about credits that come when you pay income tax. This is the first of the two programs that are uh, refundable credit. So even if you do not pay income tax, you can potentially uh, benefit from the refundable medical expense supplement. Now this is for somebody who has some employment income, a low level of employment income, uh, not enough to pay income taxes, but a high level of medical expenses. And it's an income tested refundable medical expense supplement. So for somebody who has low level of income, high level of medical expenses, they can benefit from what is a refundable supplement, even if you don't pay income taxes. We also have the amount for an eligible dependent under 18 years of age, and the amount for infirm dependents 18 years of age or older. Now, in both cases, they say uh, all it takes is a letter from the doctor. I would strongly suggest you go with the form that we talked about at the beginning of the evening, the T2201, because you're going to have to see the doctor anyhow, number one. Number two, the reality is if you get a letter from your doctor, uh, all you can access is these amounts. Whereas if you get a T2201 signed by your doctor, you can access all of the programs that we were talking about tonight. So for these amounts here, I suggest the T2201, and that's something to calculate in in terms of your income taxes. We also have the child care expenses. There's no age limit for a dependent child for whom the disability amount can be claimed. Uh, one thing to note, expenses claimed may reduce the disability amount supplement. For all people, not just people with disabilities, we have the children's fitness amount, uh, children's arts amount, and tuition, education, and textbook amounts. Uh, Revenue Canada says that uh, for a lot of families that could benefit from those amounts, uh, they don't actually take advantage of it. So they, that's why they like to remind people about those amounts, though they're not strictly limit related to disability issues. Uh, then we have the working income tax benefit. This is a second reimbursable credit. So even if you're not paying income taxes, for somebody who has a level of income, some income, even though they don't pay income taxes, uh, and they have a disability with a T2201, uh, they can get the working income tax benefit, again, income tested. And we have the child disability benefit. It's a component of the Canada child tax benefit. And it's for a child under age 18 who is eligible for the disability amount. Now there's two programs for home buyers that when it, you're buying a home for a person with a disability, you can access those programs even if you're not a first time home buyer. The first is the home buyer's amount. If you're eligible for the disability amount or you're buying a home, for the benefit of a related person who is eligible for the disability amount, you do not have to be a first time home buyer to access the home buyer's amount. As with medical expenses, it must allow the person with a disability to live in a more accessible environment. 
but as a family, you can access the home buyer's amount even if it's not the first time home. And it's the same with the home buyer's plan. If you've heard about this program, normally it's only available to people who are purchasing a first home. But if you're doing the acquisition of a home, you're buying a home for a person with a disability, again, to make their life more accessible, you can access the home buyer's plan uh, a number of times. It's the same criteria, you borrow from your RSP and you pay back your RSP, uh, but the home buyer's plan is accessible when it is for a person with disabilities, even if it's not the first time uh, that you're buying the home. And you've got the refund of the federal excise tax on gasoline. And that takes the form XE8, which makes me think of James Bond for some reason. It's the application for refund of federal excise tax on gasoline. Now, it, it doesn't matter what you use the gasoline for. Even though the federal excise tax is less than one cent a liter, and you think about it, if you come, uh, for example, and visit me in Ottawa during the parliamentary session, otherwise I'm, I'll be here, you drive across the country, you're driving all the way back, that's uh, thousands of kilometers, you could be getting a, a refund of 50, 60, 70 dollars. That's uh, uh, better than nothing, right? So even though it's not a lot of money per liter, it's something to think about. If you're a person with a disability, you can get the refund for a federal excise tax on gasoline. And we have the GST, HST rebate <coughs> as well. A rebate of GST, HST payable on the purchase price that relates the modification of the vehicle. Now we've already seen modifying the vehicle, you can apply that as a medical expense, but you can also get the GST and HST completely reimbursed. And we have the rebate of the GST, HST paid in error on medical devices and supplies, personal care, or other exempt or zero rated supplies. So, those are a lot of programs that exist. To finalize, to, to conclude tonight, we've got a cartoon from Revenue Canada. And I'll just read it to you. The first panel says, it's a woman from, obviously from Revenue Canada, and she says, Revenue Canada again, having trouble completing your tax form? Well, not to worry. In panel two, she says, simply pick up your phone and give one of our agents a call. That's all there is to it. In panel three, she says, easy, you bet. So why wait? Call us now and get the information you need. And this gentleman has obviously called Revenue Canada. He's been on hold for probably a long time because he's passed away in the meantime. You can see sort of a skeleton there. And his wife says, is the line still busy, Revenue Canada? This is the important principle that we're talking about tonight. The income tax system works, it's something that we all respect. You pay income tax and you benefit from having services that we provide together. But when the income tax system doesn't work as well, it's when information isn't distributed. And here tonight, you've learned about a whole variety of programs that most people in our community simply do not know about. 15% of the families in Burnaby and New Westminster have a member of their family who has a disability. And yet, Every year we get uh, dozens and dozens, even hundreds of people out for the first time to these disability tax credit seminars because they simply haven't received the information. So what I'd ask you to do tonight, following this meeting, if you found it useful, if you get a copy of the presentation as well, um, to circulate it as, as widely as you can to your friends and neighbors and family members, well, let's make sure everybody in Burnaby and New Westminster is aware of these programs and can benefit from it. Because what that'll mean is millions of dollars coming back to this community, which helps small businesses, it helps jobs, and it certainly helps the families that benefit. So I hope you find the information that we've given you here tonight interesting. Please let us know if we can send you a copy of the presentation. I'll be uh, around afterwards to answer any questions that people have, uh, personal questions or issue questions. Uh, and so I'll be pleased to sit down with you then. And uh, I'd like to thank George for coming out as well. And I'd like to thank, uh, yeah, and I'd like to thank all of you for coming out tonight. Please take a donut or Timbit before you leave. Enjoy your evening and thank you for coming out to this Disability Tax Credit Seminar. <laughs>